Okay, so. All right. All right, so this is my summary, which I'm going to skip. So that's for posterity. Um, recent major activities. So we're caught up in all the processing. Sectors through 56 have been processed and staged for dog approval. Uh, if they haven't already been approved, in fact, um, we just approved sector 56 via email today. So that's hot off the presses. Um, the most recent multi sector uh, search was approved and delivered to the POC on the 28th of September. Um, and then this last bullet just got updated. So thank you. <clears throat> All right. So um, one of the things I want to talk about is preparing for extended mission two. So way back in 2016 or so, we purchased a 300 terabyte three-part device uh, as our dedicated storage that we paid for. Uh, it's co-located in the advanced supercomputing division on the warehouse floor with the supercomputer at Ames, along with our servers. <clears throat> and we sized it uh, for the primary mission plus some, and it got us most of the way through the first extended mission that started filling up um, towards the end of last year. And we started getting error messages in December and February. So we've moved some of our, uh, well, <clears throat> we've then expanded into some of the shared data storage at the advanced supercomputing division, but it's really time for us to replace this device because uh, we're paying uh, $21,000 per year last year for the extended service contract, but three par at some point will no longer support it and we wouldn't be able to support it on our own. Um, so uh, the advanced supercomputing division has been very kind. They've offered us an existing 1.3 petabyte NetApp device, which is, they have 10 of these. And they're offering it to us at a very steep discount. <clears throat> and we're in the process of ordering some parts. We need to order some fiber channel connectors, some host interface mm -hmm. cards. And we've already started um, migrating our data off of the three par device onto scratch storage in preparation for setting up this, uh, this other device and getting it configured. We're looking at the disk drive pooling configurations and the RAID configuration. Um, that's all going well. And I hope that's all done by the time we, we meet again. Our oldest server, TestDB1, um, is being retired. It started having issues with file IO and uh, we were using it mainly for data analysis, but also as a backup test server. So we've removed it now. We've got a new server in. It's a Rome-based node. So that's the current best technology we have at the supercomputing division. And that's in the process of getting installed and, and turned on and all that good stuff. So this will give us um, a tremendous amount of flexibility to do expedited processing wherever and whenever that is needed. It's our most capable device because it's, it's, our, our, it's brand new. Uh, we've also lined up a list of sustaining engineering tasks uh, to increase the automation of operations and decrease the manual effort required for such. And so one of the things I'm looking to my engineers to do is to, is to automate as much as possible the processing of the FFIs because those often come down on Friday afternoons or um, Saturday mornings. And I'd really like my lead operations engineer, who's my only operations engineer, to be able to take weekends off now. <clears throat> All right, so I wanna tell you a little bit about the processing throughput um, over the course of the extended mission. So this, these are the two-minute um, statistics for the two for the two-minute targets. Uh, it's trended lower over time as we've gotten better at it. What you can see is the green represents the um, processing time, and that's been fairly steady. And is at about uh, approximately three days, pretty typical for the processing time. And then uh, <clears throat> sometimes there are go backs, and so that's what the blue uh, indicates, where the data analysis working group identifies some issue that requires some reprocessing. Uh, we've um, done pretty well at eliminating that in almost all cases. Once while we run into a corner case that requires extra thought, consideration part of the dog. And then um, there's the, also the documentation effort that has to happen before the data um, can be released to the mast. <clears throat> in both cases, we're greatly exceeding our throughput requirements. So the original requirement for our two minute processing was that we deliver it um, back to the POC for archival within 42.7 days. And our typical turnaround is, is, is 10 days or less. Um, FFI turnaround significantly exceeds the original requirements, uh, which were 13.7 days per orbit. Uh, you'll notice at the beginning of the extended mission, it took us a little while to um, 
uh, deal with the uh, three time data volume from the primary mission. We had to adjust parameters. There were no code changes, but we did have to muck around with the um, runtime configuration and super, supercomputer and some of the internal parameters in our software. But once we got that tamed down, um, uh, basically our typical turnaround time uh, at the end of, of the first extended mission is a day and the fastest was, was 0.6 days. Um, one of the biggest differences between the FFIs that we calibrate and TK is that we provide the uncertainties. Uh, so we're actually propagating those and retaining covariance information for the next step when we construct the telemetry. So that's, as everybody who's done this before, they're typically much, you know, the computational intensity of doing propagation of uncertainties is, is, is higher than that for just doing the calculation for the, for the value. And so um, the good news is that uh, the project has decided to, to send us the FFIs every half orbit. So we're processing at half orbit. So it's only 50% more data that we're processing at one time. And uh, it's too early to tell exactly where we'll land, but we think we'll be down at around 1.6 days, which is one of the experiences we've had recently. So we think that we'll be processing in about as much time as we did for the uh, first extended mission. And I'll, I'll just say that um, we deliver those to the POC and there's no reason why those can't go to the archive early if that was something that the community desired. Okay, I wanna turn my attention to the wow. test SPOC high level science product project. This is a best effort project that led by Doug Caldwell, um, my uh, for, former Kepler instrument scientist and our uh, support scientist at Ames. Um, so we do the FFI target selection in three steps. We include all of the two minute targets, which naturally includes all the 20 second targets. And then we um, select additional FFI targets based on tick parameters. So we want the H magnitude to be brighter than 10 or the distance to be less than or equal to 100 parsecs. We want the crowding metric to be at least 0.5, namely uh, at least 50% of the flux should be coming from the target itself rather than from other stars. And we uh, also have a magnitude cutoff uh, this is to limit the total number of targets to, um, to 20,000 per CCD. Uh, so we can address up to 160,000 targets. And uh, that's principally due to the way that we do the instrumental uh, corrections for the systematic effects that we have to form an ensemble and their memory limitations. So we could go higher than this, but it would require some refactoring of code for us to do it. Um, actually, actually it won't be too bad, but uh, the easiest way to do it would be to actually um, partition the CCDs for the ensembles, and then we would have more than one set of co-training basis vectors per CCD. So that would be that would be the outcome. So if that's of, of interest, then um, maybe I can talk to the MAST about how that would treat them in the community, of course. Um, anyway, um, and then we select field targets to fill up the rest uh, according to these metrics, magnitude brighter than 13.5, log G uh, greater than 3.5, and a crowding metric of at least 80%. <clears throat> all right, so for the test spot FFI light curves, we provide all the same products that we do for two minute data, namely light curves, uh, co training basis factors. So, uh, one of our principal um, motivations for doing this work was to provide co training basis vectors that were extracted from the, thank you, from the um, FFI light curves themselves rather than forcing people to bend the two minute uh, co training basis vectors. So we're doing that. And then six sector, since sector 36, we've been conducting single sector uh, transit searches. And you can see on the lower right hand, uh, 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 data validation report for a um, likely planet. Um, in terms of the sectors that are available, uh, this is the list. Uh, we have sectors one through 35 have light curves, target pixel files, sector 36 through 42, we have all of the products. We've delivered sectors 43 for 47 uh, to the mast. And then we have um, FFI data process for sectors 48 through 51. And that's uh, waiting finally review uh, before delivery. Okay, um, here's the target distribution. Uh, so sector 41 had 157,000 uh, odd targets. Um, uh, QLP had 1.3 million. We're concentrating on stars that are typically brighter that um, if we find planets around them, then hopefully we can do more follow-up and characterization of those as opposed to finding bigger stars around much dimmer targets, for example. And then you can see the surface gravity versus uh, distance and then the breakout according to the test magnitude there. 
on the bottom, you see a histogram of how we've selected targets for this particular sector, where the blue histogram is, uh, represents the two-minute targets, uh, the FFI include targets, which was the second category is the cyan, and then the red are the fuel targets. All right, and uh, just a couple days ago, uh, a summer intern that I was working for Doug this summer, uh, Kendra T. Nguyen, um, published a research note um, announcing this, our identification of 20 community C2Is, CTOIs out of, um, out of the work that she was doing. So those are gonna be hitting uh, the next slide pretty soon because the research note is now published. So it's really fun to see a summer student come in and actually find likely planets in, in the course. She's an undergrad, they're an undergrad, and it was really a uh, really great experience for, for them and for us as well. Okay, the last thing I'm gonna talk about, if I can get this to advance. Ah, so we've been collaborating for several years, actually since Kepler, with the Data Sciences Group and Intelligent Systems Division at Ames Research Center. And um, uh, we spent several years working on Kepler data and announced uh, the validation, machine learning validation of 301 new Kepler planets out of the uh, TCEs from Kepler. And then in the last uh, year or so, we've been um, conducting transfer learning and building out the, the model, uh, including additional metrics and diagnostics like difference images, unfolded light curves and such. And we're getting actually um, reasonably comparable results in terms of, of, of the performance of the machine learning algorithm, but we have a much smaller set of, of planets and known planets uh, in the training set. And so, that is one of the difficulties right now in terms of being able to validate planets. We're not at that point, but it looks like a really great tool for vetting uh, TCs uh, for planet candidates. Okay, and then uh, there's a paper that's gonna be addressed at the AAS meeting that introduces ExoMiner++ that features new diagnostic tests I just mentioned and uh, other things, but it uh, looks very promising. And um, with that, I'll just put up my conclusions and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Uh, we have the time for a quick question or two uh, in the room or on, online. I think online. In the room. All right, perfectly okay. understandable. Thank you again. Wait, Andrew, do you have a question? Do you have a sentence for how can you like phrase sustain? Ah, okay, so I'll repeat the question. So Andrew asks a completely um, cosmic question about the cosmic rays. At what point do the do we get so many cosmic rays that it saturates and the performance breaks down? So <clears throat> we had about three weeks to put together the algorithm for the cosmic rays um, with how everything worked out. <clears throat> uh, we detect cosmic rays in every pixel, but uh, we found that at least for target stars, there were a lot of cases where we were spoofed by by pointing excursions. And so uh, that's the big thing. I realized when we were doing that work that that the onboard cosmic ray mitigation algorithm was responding a lot to um, to pointing excursions. And so to, to prevent that from disrupting the flux estimate, we put in a rule that if there are, um, <clears throat> if there are, uh, three or more incidences, we we don't declare those to be cosmic rays and we remove those, i.e. we preserve the data as it is. But there are occasions when you get three cosmic rays in a single 20 second interval and we leave it in. And that's because we're not doing an image-based analysis, um, which is something that would make a lot of sense to do. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're moving on. We have a series of uh, short 10-minute uh, reports. Uh, we would try to leave one or two minutes uh, for questions. Um, I do encourage people to ask questions if there is no time during the talk itself. So ask it on the chat on Zoom. And I encourage the speakers also to go to the chat and answer those questions. You can, in the middle of your answer, you can say who, which person, like put their name, say who you're answering uh, to. 
Okay, the next talk is uh, over uh, Zoom by Hannah Lewis uh, from uh, MAST, meaning uh, SDSCI. Um, Hannah, you can uh, please uh, share your screen and um, unmute yourself yeah. and go ahead. Okay, Are you guys seeing my screen, hopefully. I see some yes. okay, you, you, you're good to go. Awesome. Um, so hi, everybody who I've not met yet. I'm Hannah Lewis. I'm the TESS Archive Operations Lead at MAST. Um, and I'm just going to do a really fast run through of uh, what you should expect for EM2 um, and where we're going to be going in the next couple of months uh, with all of TESS at MAST. Um, so first, your Spock mission data products, you should not expect to see a huge difference um, in the cadence of delivery of those products. Um, we still expect them to be delivered roughly monthly, um, and you'll access them in the same exact way that you're currently accessing any other test data that's at MAST. Um, where you will start to see changes, and you may have already noticed these things, um, the Tika HLSP is being delivered after each half orbit. Um, so that means that MAST is delivering four sets of data per sector, um, roughly weekly. Um, that timeline is a little bit in flux as we're kind of getting into the, the, the flow of EM2. Um, but for sector 56, all of those data for Tika are already available at MAST. And we did deliver those four deliveries about once a week. Um, Currently, uh, it takes about a day for us to get those data public once we're notified by the MIT team um, that they're ready. Um, if you want to bulk download them, this is the URL that you can go to. Um, it's real easy. It's a nice little shell script. You can download everything. You can download one file, whatever you need. Um, in the very near future, um, we expect within the next month or so, um, Tika FFIs will also be available in test cut. I'll go more into that in a second. Um, but we think after the FFIs are available for bulk download, so via these scripts, it'll take about another 12 to 24 hours before they're available via test cut. Um, so Tika and test cut. Um, if you're not familiar with test cut, uh, it is a user interface as well as an API that you can use um, to query test data and make FFI cutouts by yourself. Um, so this is what that interface looks like currently. If you go to mass.stsci.edu slash test cut, um, this is what you'll see. Um, and currently the default is a Spock data product and that is not going to change. So even once Tika becomes available via this interface, Spock will still be the default. Um, but we are giving users the option to select Tika products. Um, so again, default for both the user interface and the API will still be Spock. If you want something different, you have to tell it that. Um, so we're adding this new little product section to that interface um, where you can go in and change which one you want. Um, and again, we expect Tika FFIs to be available through this interface about weekly. Um, so MAST in addition to just Tika and the mission data, we also have a ton of test-based HLSP products. Um, and total, just counting the number of light curves that we have at MAST, we have more than 60 million light curves. Uh, and that number is growing every day, every week, every month. That number is getting bigger and bigger. Um, so these are some of the largest HLSPs plus the Spock mission data products. Um, and how many light curves we had for those HLSPs a year ago. So in October of 2021, um, QLP, for example, sectors one through 26, so the first, the prime mission data um, were available for QLP. Today, uh, we have nearly doubled the number of light curves available for QLP. TASOC is much larger. All of these HLSPs are a lot larger. And we've started adding new test-based HLSPs. Um, so again, these data sets are continuing to grow. Um, and if you're interested in a specific HLSP in a specific sector, it's probably coming if it's not already available online. 
Um, so as we're, we're getting into this really big data regime with the HLSPs, but also with the mission data itself, um, we are hoping that astronomers and people at MAST and MIT and everywhere um, want to move in kind of this cloud computing direction. Um, and for that, we have this wonderful tool called Tyke, which is the Time Series Integrated Knowledge Engine. Um, and what it is, you can go to this website and check it out if you're interested. Um, it's a Jupyter Lab environment that has a ton of pre-installed software. Um, it has very generally useful things, matplotlib, numpy, scipy, um, as well as things that are very test focused. So AstroCut and LightCurve, products that you probably have installed already in your own Python environment. Um, but this provides a way to keep those packages updated and standardized across whatever environment you're working in. Um, Tyke provides a ton of tutorials for using these tools as well. So if you're new to test, you're new to Lightcurve, go check these tutorials out. They're really helpful. Um, and Tyke also provides data at your fingertips. So you don't have to download anything to work on the Tyke. If you have a very small amount of memory on your laptop, don't download test data. Go to the Tyke. The data is already there in the cloud. Um, this is a great tool. I highly encourage you to check it out if you haven't already. Um, and if you plan to come to AAS and the test data workshop, Tyke will be used to run that workshop as well so that we know everyone has a working environment um, and we're all on the same page to get that workshop started as fast as we can. Um, so with that, I'll just leave these couple of bullet points up and take any questions. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, time for a question or two. Online or in the room. Uh, John in the back. Ah, Andrew also in the back. Uh, thank you so much for working with the Tika Enterprise and Tesla. I was wondering if there would be an API way to request Tika in addition to the button that we show on the web. So the question is about API. Yeah. whether there is an API way to get the data. Tika specifically or, or any data? To extract particular spot at the size of when you're querying by an API. So for Tika data for the API? Yeah, there, are, there must be a switch um, when you query the test cut through the API and not when you do it from the request, right? When you, que you query the test cut through the API, yeah. can you get the TICA yeah. data right. as opposed to other kinds of data? Right. Can you select the yeah. Is there a plan to implement that capability? Yes. Yeah. So, so the API will get a very similar update to the user interface um, for test cut specifically. Um, it will just be an added keyword that you'll specify product equals TICA. Um, and you can get the FFIs that way. Um, you can't currently get the Tika FFIs via, via Astro Query, um, or sorry, via Lightcurve, um, but we have notified the Lightcurve team. So that, that is something they're aware of, that Tika FFIs will be available. Um, so hopefully if you are used to using Lightcurve, uh, very soon you should be able to get um, Tika cutouts that way as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's thank the speaker again. The next talk is also remote by uh, Jesse Christensen. Uh, Jesse, I see you're already sharing, so you're good to go. All right, thanks, Avi. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, uh, good to good to see you all. Sorry, I can't be there in person. Um, so yes, this is just a quick update on what we've been doing at Exofop Tests. The biggest update of which is that it is no longer Exofop Tests. <laughs> now it is Exofop. One Exofop to rule them all. We have merged the Exofop, Kepler, K2, and test portals into one place, uh, which is uh, a lot of work behind the scenes, but basically just to make your lives easier, there's only one place you have to go to find your information on your targets, because they're all the same stars on the sky in the end. Okay, so for new-ish folks in the room, or just a refresher, because it's been a couple of years, uh, who am I? I'm Jesse Christensen. I'm the lead scientist at the NASA Exoplanet Archive. 
what is ExoFOP. Um, ExoFOP is the Exoplanet Follow-Up Observation Program, which is uh, designed to help Kepler and K2 and TESS turn their candidates into confirmed planets. Uh, so why I'm here in the room is that we support the TESS mission, uh, the Science Office, the GI Office and MAST uh, with engagements in the community uh, through the extended missions. Hooray, good for EA for EM2 kicking out. Um, and so what we really are is a, a big sandbox for you to uh, upload data on your favorite test targets, uh, to upload things like CTOIs. It was uh, exciting to see in John's talk, we have CTOIs coming out of the spot now. Um, so we have a lot of data available. We try to host the data, we try to host observations, uh, we try to develop tools for you to access the data, uh, and we try to make as many levels of data and ways to access the data as possible. Like basically, what can we do to make your lives easier? How do we make this process efficient? Okay, so an update on our holdings. Um, so the number of uploaded files is over 860,000. Uh, this might seem like a jump from last time when it was like 100,000 test targets, uh, test files, but that's because of the big merger of Kepler and K2 and TESS. There are still over 100,000 uh, test files, um, many hundreds of thousands of stellar parameters, uh, and there's a lot going on. Uh, we have planet parameters, observing notes, spectroscopy, imaging, time series observations, uh, many, many files, um, and tags you guys actually adopted the tags we love it uh we love to see it hopefully it's helping you organize your observations by tagging data that belong together let us know how that's working for you if if you want to change anything um we're glad to see people have adopted it and it's interesting to see all of the different ways people use the tags um so let us know if it's working for you this is just a, some of the sorts of information that we have available okay um so this is the front page i'm going to start by saying don't forget to log in when you come to ExoFOP. That you, if you're in the test follow-up observing group, you will uh, see more when you are logged in. And sometimes you'll come to the front page and be like, wait, where did X, Y, Z go? It's probably because you're not logged in. Don't forget to log in. If you use ExoFOP, uh, here's our standard citation. Um, please don't forget to use that. Uh, the usage of um, ExoFOP uh, throughout the referee literature has been increasing every year. So, you know, if you build it, they will come. It's great to see that you guys are using the site uh, and acknowledging the site, that's great. Um, while we're here, uh, and because we're in the extended mission, I wanna do a refresh on our professional conduct policy. So this is where you can find it on the front page. All ExoFOP users are expected to follow this policy. Um, so please have a reread uh, of how to, you know, access and acknowledge and use the data. And in particular, because we're you know, well into the mission now, we're well out of some of the proprietary periods of the TFOP data, I just wanna remind folks of this specific clause right here. Any use of unpublished ExoFOP data should include contacting the owner of the data, i.e. the user who uploaded the data. Use of the data in a publication should include explicit acknowledgement and or co-authorship of the data owner on the publication as neg negotiated between you and the data owner. So it's a fantastic resource for people to share observations and collaborate together. What we don't want is people to not get credit for the data they're uploading. And I don't think anybody wants that. Uh, otherwise people would stop using the site. So just a reminder that we expect everyone to follow this policy. Okay, we have one place to land now, the single entry portal. Um, so we are now, because we've put it all in one place, you can put any kind of identifier in this search box. You can put a tick name, a TOI name, a Kepler name, a KOI name, an EPIC name, uh, a confirmed planet name. Come here, type it in. If we have the alias at ExoFOP or ExoPlanet Archive, we'll take you to that. Uh, we still have your favorite KOIs and TOIs and CTOIs, even though they're all merged together. So you can still find your lists if you need. Uh, and this is another thing I just wanted to highlight. We have over 30, 1,300 accounts. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of uh, people using this and 275 unique accounts that have uploaded data uh, when it was ExoFOP test. So yay, you guys. Um, I'm just gonna do a quick video of how to do a search because this can be complicated. Let's say I have a night at Palomar last night, which I did. I'm really sorry. I'm doing this on like three hours sleep. Uh, and I wanted to find some targets. I have imaging, so I'm gonna look for the highest priority imaging targets from SG3. There's 120, that's probably too many for one night, even on Palomar. So let's just get the brightest targets. Show me everything that's brighter than 12th. Okay, 23 targets, fantastic. I'm gonna download that target list and there's my target list for tonight, hooray. And if I really like that search, I wanna point out that next to that, 
if you can see my cursor, I don't know if you can, uh, is the save search button. So that's a new thing since last time we spoke. If there's a search you do all the time, you can save it and just run that search every time. Easy. Okay. Probably the biggest change that has affected everybody is that we just switched out the overview pages underneath your feet. Um, so I understand that that means they look different and stuff is in different places. Please ask us if you can't find something, everything we think should be on the new overview pages. So if you can't find it, it should be there. And if it's not, we can put it there. Um, so just as a quick go, so we have the observing notes. Uh, oh yes, so we have a little flag if it's a TOI or a KOI or a K2 target or a Kepler target. We've got the observing notes, the change log in the top right. This is the nav bar, which always stays there as you scroll down the page. You can use it to jump around the page very easily. Um, these are the priorities. You can still find all of the test information here. Um, if I move the zoom bar, I can move through this more quickly. Um, and here's the page. Uh, so the cool thing about these new pages, and I promise we didn't just do it just to mess with you, is that all of these tables are now filterable and sortable and searchable. Uh, and so if I go to the next one, you can see an example, you can change the order of the columns, you can filter, search, sort uh, on any of these. Um, so these are much more interactive tables, much more useful. Um, so here's just an example of me sorting, moving columns, applying a filter. This is all pretty cool, especially once we start to get more and more data, which we have because you guys are great. Okay, so we have a lot of data. How do you get it? Um, each of those big tables that I pointed out, the TOIs, the CTOIs, the KOIs, you can download that tell table in a variety of formats. Uh, any of the types of observations we have, so imaging, spectra, uh, time series, um, we have scripts that you can use to download those data um, in a variety of formats for a variety of lists of targets. Um, so please go to the download PHP scripts, which you can find from the front page to look at all of the different scripts we have for downloading data. Uh, one example that I'll show here is just the, if you wanted to get all of the imaging data we have or some subset of it, here's an example script that you could use. Uh, and finally, with this new of overview page upgrade, one of the things you can do now is just download everything on a single target. Um, so this is the URL for tick 43423 If you just add and JSON at the end of that URL, you're going to get the whole page, the whole, all of the data on the page, uh, in a JSON wow. format, which is uh, you know static and repeatable across all of them, so you can just script this up. If you have a Python script and you just want to be able to get you know the parameters for a given target, you can just put this line in, get this JSON, pass it out. Um, so now everything everything on those pages is accessible for your scripts. Um, the files themselves aren't within the JSON structure. There are you know file names and links and stuff, but the actual files aren't in there. But the list of files and what's available is there. All right, and then I will just. I think I'm running a bit over. So instead of showing this, I will say we have a very cool plot uh, at um, the transit service um, where you can show the air mass now. So I'm skip to the end. We have air mass plots now, which is very useful for people doing follow up. That's at the Exoplanet Archive transit service. Um, and finally, the next thing coming up is target list management. So the, the downside of putting everything in one website is now there's a lot to do on that one website. And we want to be able to let people bite off smaller chunks. Um, so one of the next pieces of development we're doing is target list management. So groups can coordinate together on their favorite list of 200 stars. What do we need to upload? Where are we at? And, you know, work together on that list. Um, so I will stop there. Thanks, Avi. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, one quick question, uh, George. Pause from the live audience, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Jesse. Um, what that you mentioned was that this can uh, accommodate the 275 users. Now, is that 275 users at any given time or a total of 275 users that have been registered? And the second part of my question is um, is that sufficient? I don't think that there's more people than 275 that would be interested in using the facility at any given time. Uh, so, Jesse, uh, to repeat the question, you mentioned 275 users. Is that Simultaneous or in total? That's the number of unique accounts that have uploaded data. So there are 1,300 people who have, uh, you know, set up an account across the original three services, Kepler K2 and TESS. Um, so those are people who just have a login. Anybody can come to the website uh, and not log in ever and get the publicly available data. If you set up an account, um, then you can upload data. Uh, and if you're a TFOP member, you can, you can download TFOP data. 
Um, so 275 is the number of unique accounts that have uploaded data to ExoFOP tests. And, and that number will grow. Oh yeah, I mean, it's, it's growing all the time. <laughs> um, uh, the last time I gave this talk, we had just broken a thousand accounts. So we're already 30% over that. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, Jesse. Thank you. And uh, we will uh, move on. The next speaker is um, Karen Collins. Um, so Karen, you can uh, show and good to go. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I have the privilege of, of reporting on the huge volume of work that's been done by the SG1 team, uh, very active team. And let's just take a look at, at what has been done so far. Okay, there we go. Uh, for newcomers, the SG1 team does light curve photometric follow-up of TOIs. Our main goal, of course, is to confirm the TOI event as on target or off target. And when the events are too shallow to detect from the ground, kind of less than a uh, uh, thousand ppm, uh, we attempt to rule out NEVs. So uh, beyond that, we do transit depth chromaticity checks for a little bit deeper transits. And uh, we, refine ephemerities when we do have on-target detections, and we work with several T TTB monitoring projects. Uh, the team is spread across the world. Here is a sampling. Uh, we have 420 members today, and that is uh, consists of professional, student, and citizen astronomers, as well as ground-based surveys and Gaia test, uh, the Gaia test collaboration. Uh, so far, we have over 10,000 SG-1 contributed light curves uploaded to ExoFOP, and those light curves have been included in uh, about 170 published test papers so far. And currently, we are contributing to uh, 51 additional papers that are in prep as we speak. Uh, just to touch on uh, the Gaia test collaboration, I want to point out, out that Aviad Panahi has a talk on Friday. He'll give you full details and show you the results and how it works. But essentially, um, it's Gaia time series photometry that are currently unpublished that are used to identify uh, the source of some TOI detections. Another project led by high school student, uh, Gabrielle Ross. Uh, they're led by Andrew Vander, she's led by Andrew Vanderberg and Zoe DeVeres. Uh, Gabrielle has developed software from what I understand pretty much all on her own uh, to search DT ZTF archival imagery for NEBs. So, uh, you have very talented uh, high school students uh, also working on tests, follow up in quotes. And uh, I always have to uh, mention all of our SG1 members that contribute SG1 tools. Uh, the one that a lot of you may know is the Test Transit Finder or TTF. Um, the Swarthmore finding charts, and a new tool, an LCO download tool that we will eventually make public to all LCO users. It really improves uh, access to LCO data and to get them downloaded quickly. All three of those tools have been developed by Eric Jensen at Swarthmore, and thank you very much, Eric. The um, you see an example of the Swarthmore finding charts uh, down below on the left. The, those are available from links on the TTF from the SG-1 sheet and also ExoFOP. Uh, on ExoFOP, you will see the uh, Swarthmore finding chart link. Uh, a new addition, uh, all, all of these tools have been now updated to DR3. Uh, and a new addition is you will see the Gaia variability and EB catalog uh, stars highlighted in uh, orange. 
And you can click on those and see what the Gaia data are telling you. Here we have a 23-day EB, which is too far away from the target star to be in effect. But it's nice to be able to get a quick overview of the field. The green squares show you uh, stars that are bright enough to have caused the test event. Uh, because of our huge amount of test data, uh, TOIs now, uh, the TTF was getting a little bit slow. So Eric has done work to parallelize the searches and that's improved performance now by three or four. And he's added a new option, basically this checkbox here, because there, now there's a long list for any specific um, uh, observatory every night of targets to choose from. So if you want to try to schedule more than one target per night, you can pick your first target, uh, enable this checkbox, and then uh, all other um, events that overlap with this event will be taken off the user interface so that you can more quickly find a second target. Other tools are the test observation coordinator where it lets people post planned observations so that uh, our team can try to avoid overlapping uh, each other. The uh, Gaia to Aperture, uh, Gaia to AIJ Aperture tool, both of these were contributed by John Kilkoff. He continues uh, every um, semester to enhance and support those tools. Thank you very much, John. And the uh, Astro Image J NDB check tool was written and contributed by Dennis Conte. Uh, Conti, and he continues to support and enhance that tool. And um, then finally, TG Tam uh, contributed our upload script that greatly simplified um, us uploading our data to Exofop. Uh, AIJ5 is, is now released and provided for folks that don't have a custom pipeline. And uh, Kevin Eastridge is our George Mason University uh, postgraduate. He's our key developer. And the primary uh, upgrades in 5.0 are to help streamline the SU-1 data reduction process and make results more precise and, uh, uh, oh, and also that we've improved FIT support so that we can now support direct input of test cuts, Spock FFIs, <clears throat> TICA FFIs and Spock postage stamps for direct point and click analysis in AIJ. So this opens up to folks that are not um, uh, keen on scripting to do point and click analysis of test data. Uh, we have a lot more work in progress. Uh, again, all centered around SG-1 user support and, and uh, analyzing test data for the masses and a new build system that's already created community contributed development uh, support for Asteroid Mache features. Uh, one new project that is led by our SG-1 citizen scientist, Greg Serdok, uh, is using some of the new uh, uh, AIJ features. He has scripted AIJ to download and analyze all available test cut FFI sectors um, for all TOIs. So what he's doing is scanning through to find TOIs that are uh, now known to be uh, offset by more than an hour or two so that we can adjust those ephemerities and save our uh, follow-up time. And then some final notes, um, there's a new planet validation working group uh, that uh, we're keenly interested in uh, from the SG-1 perspective. This is led by Steve Bryson. Uh, he has a discussion segment later today, so stay tuned for that. Uh, I think it'll be a very interesting uh, discussion. Um, I will apologize in advance to the um, uh, SU-1 team, I'm behind on reviewing your submitted data and updating dis, uh, dispositions, um, but we are trying to arrange uh, to bring on a data aid assistant for me to help with that and amongst other things. Uh, it's not firm yet, but just to put it out there, 
what we're going to be probably looking for is a recent bachelor's or master's uh, physics and astronomy graduate. Uh, ideally with a significant uh, amount of transit observing experience as well as data reduction experience. Uh, they need writing experience because we have to keep up with these large numbers of papers that are coming through every week. And so if you know somebody that might be a good fit, just shoot me an email if it's you or someone else, and we'll keep your names handy in case we are able to get this uh, uh, put in place. Uh, one quick note is the uh, test follow-up LCO key project uh, current ends in 2023. That's the current key project. Uh, there's a new call out um, and we will certainly be putting everything we can into our proposal to continue this key project and a second key project. And if we're successful, we will continue that work into 2023B and beyond. Have to always send out a special thanks to Kevin Collins. He uh, is a, a George Mason graduate student and he takes part of his day every day and looks through all of the LCO observations that get requested and then filters out the ones that get, uh, re that are good enough to be reduced and then organizes that within the uh, LCO analysis team. And then finally, thank you uh, to the amazingly productive uh, overall SG1 team. Uh, you've made it a challenge to keep up with, but that's a good challenge and we're trying to fix that. So thank you. Thank you, Karen. Are there any questions online or in person? Okay, if there are none, uh, thank you, Karen, again. Uh, we'll move on. Next is uh, Alison, and she's, she's in the room. Yeah, I don't see any similar things, but we can do. Yeah, what I meant to do, so I'm just trying to see if you can enhance it. But so long, you don't need to. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right, hi everyone. Uh, I am not Sam Quinn, who is the SG2 lead uh, for recon spectroscopy, but Sam gave a great talk this morning. So Dave asked me to step in and kind of give a summary on SG2. So my name is Allison Barilla. Um, I am active in Dave's group on SG2 and SG1. So I'm gonna do my best to try to summarize some of the work going on. Um, so first I just wanna point out that Sam runs these uh, spec SC meetings every um, month, which are really productive and great to attend if you can. Um, he actually hosts two, so there's an East Coast Europe friendly time at 10 a.m. on Mondays. The upcoming ones are October 24th and November 28th and uh, skipping the December meetings. And then the West Coast friendly is 7 p.m. Eastern time uh, on a Wednesday, uh, October 26th, November 30th. So add it to your calendar if you're interested. If you don't get the invites, uh, you can reach out to Sam and he can share that with you. But it's a great way for SG2 members to kind of get a feel for what's going on. Um, if you don't want to search the gigantic spreadsheet, <laughs> Uh, that all the has all the information. It's a great way to just collaborate and, and um, touch base with the other members. Um, so I searched the uh, SG2 spreadsheet yesterday, spent some time uh, trying to make some sort of meaningful plot. Um, and I don't know if this was productive, but everyone loves a great pie chart, right? Um, this is hardly a great pie chart, but it is a pie chart. Um, so the main takeaway here is, is um, as you can see, maybe on the right-hand side is um, trace recon. Um, Trace is a huge active role in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and if you can read these numbers, let's see. So, uh, you know, there's a percentage, so it's 57.2%. And this number here is by TOI. So this is, this pie chart is spectrographs and how many TOIs they've um, observed, more or less. Now, that is an underestimate, I can say, but it's just hand wavy, a rough idea of some of the numbers. So 
so Trace in the north is very, very active. Um, and then Chiron in the south um, at something like 20% with 684. BS NRES, Corley, high res, there's a bunch of active members, but um, clearly there's a, a large um, portion going into these kind of two Chiron and Trace. Um, so since uh, I'm a little bit active in, on the Trace side and uh, it's 57.2%, um, I'm gonna spend the 57.2% of my time talking about Trace. Uh, I hope that's okay. Um, let's see. So uh, Dave Latham kind of organizes and does all the behind the scenes. Um, so more or less targeting TOIs that are brighter than 13 and a half and declination north of negative 30, which seems impossible, but it depends on the, the magnitude really, but uh, he has been known to go down that low. Um, so uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with TRACE, which maybe there are a few, um, TRACE is the Tillinghast Reflector Shell Spectrograph. It's at the Whipple Observatory in Arizona. Um, and on the left there is a picture of the ridge. Um, and so this is just south of Tucson. The um, bigger dome in the front here is the um, 1.5 meter telescope, which is pictured on the right. Um, and that hosts trace for almost all the nights every month. There's a few that go to the low resolution spectrograph, um, but more or less mo most of that time, much of that time is, is dedicated to test um, follow-up. Um, and I'll just point out for the SG-1 members, this dome to the right is the 1.2 meter telescope that hosts uh, Kepler cam, which is very active in SG-1. Uh, they're connected by a building, uh, so they're, they're neighbors. Um, so the trace uh, spectrograph is uh, our 44,000 optical fiber fed spectrograph. Um, so here's a kind of summary slide of some of the data products that kind of come out of the pipeline. So each night the pipeline is run, the pipeline is developed by Lars Bouquet. Um, and so we have a, an extracted spectrum and this quick look classification plot, which is uh, runs this. So the pipeline runs the stellar parameter classification tool to get stellar parameters. Uh, the quick look uh, is sped up a bit by fixing a solar metallicity. So we get effective temperature, surface gravity, and rotational velocity um, with this fixed solar metallicity. It also derives uh, a, a radial velocity based on a single order magnesium V line. Um, and those are more or less updated on a weekly basis. Um, I have to point out that there are observing notes on ExoFOP. 3,906 that have been handwritten by Dave Latham. Ooh, um, this is a gold mine, folks. Like if you don't read these, you absolutely need to. Like Dave Latham uh, is giving you these notes for free. So absolutely, yeah, woohoo Dave, absolutely. Um, read the notes, um, they're very, very helpful. Um, and those are uploaded daily. And then we have, a, on a monthly basis, we upload stellar parameters, now running the full version of SBC with uh, leaving metal to use a free parameter to give you more accurate stellar parameters. Um, and we recently implemented a, a quality flag um, indicator. So I'll talk about that in just a second. But I just wanted to show um, an example of one of the quick look plots that you might be able to find online. Um, if, you're not look, if you're not used to looking at spectra, I'll just point out, you know, this up here is the magnesium B order where we derive the velocities. The blue is the spectra, the red is the model fit. And this is the stellar parameters that come out of that quick look. You can see uh, zero metallicity for the solar metallicity, but it gives you the temperature log G and the rotational velocity. Down here, we have the correlation uh, template peak height. We have the rate of velocity, the barycentric correction. Um, and there's two other pages that kind of give you different portions of the spectrum. But these are great to take a look at um, online and get some information. Um, you may see some that look more like this. Um, you can note there's like uh, slightly, uh, the star is slightly rapidly rotating. And you can see now two peak heights here indicating a double line spectrum. Um, if you're not used to looking at spectra or you don't want to learn, read read the note. Um, Dave, Dave says double line spectrum. Um, it's really good to get information out of this. So um, I highly encourage you to read the notes. Um, I'll spend the last, I don't know how much time, a minute talking about the stellar parameters that we uploaded. So um, if you like decision trees, here you go. If you don't, I'll kind of walk you through this. Um, more or less, we have four different um, quality flags. So excellent, uh, good, fair, and poor. Um, the excellent is for stars that are not rapidly rotating. So less than 40 kilometers per second. In this temperature range, FTK type, more or less stars with a good cross correlation peak height. Um, that would be considered an excellent target, uh, excellent stellar parameters. 
Um, if it's slightly lower signal to noise, it would fall into the, the good category. Um, cooler temperature stars, which SBC was not developed for, um, also go into the good category. Um, but we do inflate those errors because they're just less trustworthy in some regard. Um, if we do happen to find a rapid rotator greater than 40 kilometers per second and the signal to noise is good enough, we then um, will upload the rotational velocity um, to, to help people know for follow-up that this is a rapid rotator. Uh, it might not be good for PRV work. Um, everything else uh, goes into the poor category and we don't upload those. Uh, so here's kind of the summary for the trace data. Uh, so basically all TUIs uh, have been run through this pipeline as of September 30th. So it's a little over 5,000 spectra um, and 4,600 more or less were uploaded. And those are kind of the categories most fall into the excellent category. Um, I will say uh, thank you to the Exopop team for merging uh, everything. Uh, it's made uploading uh, really great. We can upload all our old spectra from K2 and, and Kepler. Um, so uh, we've done that for the K2 mission. So another 1600 spectra, 1500 uploaded. Um, and these are kind of the categories as well. Um, and Kepler uh, upload will be coming soon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions uh, in the room or, or online? Good. Okay. Uh, if there are no more questions, uh, thank you again. Sure. Thanks. And the next speaker in this series of uh, TFOP subgroup uh, reports is Diana Dragomir. Uh, she's online. Uh, Diana, can you um, share your screen and unmute yourself? Yeah, so I thought Dave Ciardi was speaking too. <laughs> uh, okay, I guess we're skipping that one. All right, so um, hi everyone. Maybe. Yep. What was that? Okay, everything is okay. Uh, you can go ahead. Okay. Oh, look at that. I have wrong dates at the bottom. I thought I changed everything. Okay. Anyway, just ignore those. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Diana Dragomir. I'm an assistant professor at the University of New Mexico. Um, and I have the easiest uh, subgroup uh, to lead, uh, which is space-based photometry uh, working group. And uh, so let me just jump right into it and follow on what Karen described as the reasons we want to obtain follow-up photometry. So Karen did a great job of explaining why we need those. Um, and we do get most of the observations, uh, follow-up photometric observations from the ground, but for shallower transit, so maybe on the order of one part per thousand or less, um, and or transits with longer durations um, that we would like to completely cover and observe. Um, we prefer to go to space because we can do it uh, uh, more easily. So the goals of SG5 are, uh, at least in my view, uh, so validating that um, TOIs are on target, uh, improving transit and ephemeris parameters, um, possibly monitoring uh, transit timing variations, and finally, um, following up on <laughs> planets with ambiguous spirits, so either planets that show just one transit or two transits, um, and I'll come back to this in a moment. The current facilities that we use for this are KOPS, um, and that consists of a, a guaranteed time observing program and uh, also a G guest investigator, a guest observer program. Um, I'm more involved with the guest observer side. I think you will talk more about the guest, uh, the guaranteed time side as well. Um, and this is a 30 centimeter aperture, uh, 0.3 to 1.1 micron band pass. And then we have a Canadian satellite, uh, Neosat, which is smaller. And I should say it wasn't designed for precision photometry. Uh, it was designed for tracking asteroids. But um, it was uh, repurposed <laughs> to uh, precision photometry among other uses. Um, and it has no filter. Uh, the, the detector covers more or less the same bandpass as chaos. All right, so let me show you a little bit on each. Uh, I don't want to spoil upcoming talks. 
Um, so this is just something I'm not even going to read out. Hugh Osborne is going to tell you more about um, his efforts to get um, TOIs observed through the GTO program um, to help validate and improve transit parameters. Um, also, Hugh and Amy Tucson will, and her talk is tomorrow, will tell you about how um, HEOPS is being used to observe uh, transits that are, we have multiple transits for a particular planet candidate, but there's a large gap in between them. So we don't know what the period, uh, we know that there is a number of periods that could match those two transits, but we don't necessarily know which one is the correct one. So we have to systematically search uh, every period to determine the correct one. So Amy and, and Hugh are leading this program on chaos. All right, moving on, let me show you um, some data. So this is from the guest observer side on chaos. I submitted a couple of proposals to improve the parameters of TOIs that don't have, at least at the time, didn't have a whole lot of transits in the test data, in the test observations, because they were intermediate to long period planets. Uh, so here we're looking at just two examples, uh, TOI 262 on the left and TOI 444 on the right. Um, and you're seeing on the bottom, the face folded test transit transits. And then at the top, the I believe in each case, these are single uh, visits uh, with chaos. So you can see, uh, I wanted to show you here the precision one can get. Of course, these are different magnitude stars, but the precision one can get um, uh, for shallower transits as well, if the star is sufficiently bright with just one transit. So you can see Chaos is doing really well. Um, this data, by the way, in the next couple of slides are from a paper that one of my students, Dominic Otto, just submitted. It's a massive paper. <laughs> um, but he's doing this very careful comparison of Tess and Chaos observations. Um, these are the TOIs that are in his paper. And I kind of highlighted, uh, you know, the method that's just one method. So to guide your eye to um, how you should compare these. But basically, you can see that for most of those, uh, the chaos observations, even if it was just one visit and sometimes two, really helped improve the precision uh, on the transit depth and therefore on the transit radius compared to just the test observations. Um, so that's good to see. Um, in, some case, in some cases, that wasn't the case. Uh, and well, we can talk about that later if we have time. OK, let me show you what this looks like. There we go. Um, so I'm going to, how much time do I have? <laughs> um, I'm going to uh, try and describe this plot quickly. So here are the stars we observed to so the stars of the TOIs. Um, and you the have four more minutes. What was that? You have four more minutes. Four? Okay. Uh, on the horizontal axis, we have the star temperature. And then on the vertical axis, we have the equivalent number of transits that one chaos transit uh, is expected to be equal to. Uh, expected or um, or reality, right? So how many transits is one chaos transit equivalent to? How many test transits? Um, so, and this line is kind of the, the line, the theoretical line that we expect. And you can see most of the points are below the line. So CAPS is doing pretty well, but in some cases it's not doing quite so well. It could be a variety of reasons like fainter stars pushing towards the faint end or fast or, or just um, high period of variability uh, during the observations. And of course, in a couple of cases, uh, CAPS is doing better than expected. Um, and if we have time, I can comment on those 118 and 455 and what's going on there. Um, but I should mention that it may not be that chaos, I mean, chaos is doing really well for those targets, but it could also be that test isn't doing as well as expected for those targets. So when we're doing that comparison, uh, it's, it's important to take both into account. But in any case, we're pretty happy. Uh, here is a plot of um, the noise over 30 minute uh, intervals. Uh, for the star, the low stars of two eyes in uh, Dominic's paper, um, and this is a function of GMAG. Uh, what's really nice here is that we're populating uh, a little 
uh, range of magnitudes here that the the chaos uh, team hadn't uh, at least formally populated yet. And this is the, um, well, the red line is the one you should be comparing these observations to in terms of photon noise. Um, so it's it's doing all right relative to photon noise and as expected towards uh, fainter stars, um, it's, you know, the noise is a little bit higher than expected. All right, and then finally, NeoSat, uh, just a couple of examples as a function of magnitude. Um, here's a candidate um, that was observed at a time when it did not transit at the top and a time when it did transit at the bottom. So you can see that even though the scatter is pretty large, uh, the diff you can tell the difference between when there is a transit versus when there isn't one. And again, this is a really faint star, even for Kelps, let alone for Neosat. So I think this is pretty okay. good for Neosat. Um, here's another example. This was an attempt to capture a new transit of a single transit candidate, TOI429. It's a little bit brighter. In this case, we were not able to be sure. Uh, we haven't covered the full uh, window that we wanted to cover, unfortunately, um, due to other observations that were taken um, simultaneously or contemporaneously with the, our observations, but it shows you the precision we can get for a brighter star. And then finally, um, Here's an even brighter star. Um, and this one uh, was again a campaign that lasted what, like about a week, um, tr trying to catch the full transit window for this particular single transit candidate as well. Um, in this case, single transit, the single transit and radio velocities were used to determine the next transit window. Uh, and in this case, it was uh, it was caught by Neosat. And uh, here it is. Um, and there's more uh, more coming as people are discovering that Neosat is a really valuable resource where you can get weeks of time <laughs> to do this kind of work. All right, I'll stop here. Thank you. Okay, uh, any questions online or in the room? Um, so, uh, Diana, you showed a lot of new SAT results. Uh, I think that is something just familiar to this community. So, can you briefly say, like, telescope size, who built the telescope, automatic capability, more or less? Sure, yeah. Um, I can bring it back if you want. Um, oops. So, Neo, so I did mention the telescope size back here. Um, so, this is a Canadian telescope, and only Canadians have access. However, um, through either me or uh, who will put you in touch with Chris Mann or Chris Mann himself, um, who's a student at Université de Montréal, you'd be able to um, get your target observed. Um, just uh, get in touch with either one of us and we can set that up. Um, it's, it's a fairly small telescope. So again, that, that explains the um, poor, poorer photometric precision compared to chaos, um, but I think it's doing uh, pretty well otherwise. And they can observe, uh, an important part of NeoSat is that it can observe um, any part of the sky, particularly in summer uh, during eclipse season when, um, while the while the earth is between, uh, uh, well, sorry, while uh, NeoSat doesn't have the restriction of having to point its solar panels towards the sun, it can actually point anywhere in the shadow of the earth during that time. Um, so it's that's how we observed four to nine long before it started rising on from the ground. Um, so yeah, so that's another uh, benefit perhaps over Cheops, which is more restricted in terms of what it can observe when. Okay, thank you. Any question? Last question. Okay, so thank you, Diana, again, and thank for all the speakers of, uh, of the session. Um, next, we have a break until 3.30, and again, that is in uh, local Boston time, meaning 3.30 East Coast time, PM. Uh, for those online, that's about almost 50 minutes uh, from now. Um, so uh, we will uh, see you then. And um, one more thing, if you have any more questions, feel free to put them in the chat and the speakers of the last session, please you know, keep an eye on, on the chat if there are suddenly any questions that are relevant for you. Um, 
and and now we can go and get some coffee.